Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the National Library of Scotland. It's great to see so many of you here today, both in person and also online. I'm Chris Fleet, map curator here at the library. And just before we get going, uh, a quick reminder to say, please put your phone uh, into silent mode if you have one. Now, when I first started as a, a shiny new curator at the National Library of Scotland in 1994, the Pomp maps were the one group of maps that we never showed to visitors in an original form due to their fragility and significance. Poor quality photocopies were the best that anyone was likely to see. So when the library first acquired a digital camera, our first digital camera in 1996, the Pomp maps were the obvious candidate for trial digitization. They had tiny text on a variety of paper sizes and the opportunity of vastly improved public access. Now the results in fact completely blew away all expectations and unleashed a new wave of research from a variety of scholars who beforehand really hadn't been able to see the original maps. So Project Pont was born a five-year research program with seminars, field trips and talks, and a concluding published book, exhibition and website. It wasn't long before the TV cameras rolled on in, and so it seemed our friend Timothy Pont was being rescued from obscurity and becoming an international superstar <coughs> and household name. Now, I've always been relieved that we've yet to see a blockbuster action movie starring Tom Cruise as uh, Timothy Pont. So since that time, really, the Pont maps have always been very close to my heart. And it's a great pleasure coinciding with the display of an original Pont map in our Treasures Gallery, just on the other side of the hall, to focus again on Pont's magnificent maps and the man who drew them because the Pont manuscript maps are undoubtedly one of Scotland's greatest historical and geographical treasures, providing us with a window into 16th century Scotland, her regions, and their distinctive features. They're the first detailed survey of the Scottish landscape, the first time Scotland was mapped comprehensively, and the first time many Scottish settlements and places ever appeared on the map. We have a lot to cover today and a lot of questions. Who was Pont? What did he do? What material survives by Pont and why is it important? Part of the answer to this lies in what Pont chose to show and describe. Another important question is how did he do it? The practicalities of his surveying and drafting. And perhaps most interestingly, why and for whom? These questions are all the more compelling given the age in which Pont was at work mapping Scotland in the turbulent years of the Counter-Reformation. Map making was also becoming increasingly a state concern and the centre of gravity was also moving from Italy to the Low Countries for map publishing. So finally, we'll look at Pont's maps, how they were eventually published, by whom, the enduring afterlife of Pont's work. How did Pont's work become the basis for Scotland's first atlas? And why did it actually take 30 years for this to happen after Pont had died? Now to briefly set the scene, let's look at this map of Scotland, which dates from the same decade that Timothy Pont was born. And it's also our first map of Scotland, the first time the country appears on its own in a single map. Although recognizable, it's extremely misshapen, the content largely derived from written sources, not a direct survey. There's also a very limited number of place names, in fact, just over 120 place names. And it was drafted and engraved in Italy. Now, through Timothy Pont, we see a complete revolution in map making. Here was a native Scot for the first time charting the country's bounds and its geographical features through a first-hand survey at unprecedented levels of detail. 
and collectively gathering over 20,000 names of places. So our story must begin with Pont, although the facts in fact we have that we have on him are quite sparse. So far as is known, Timothy was born in the mid 1560s, possibly 1565 or 66. He was the second son of Robert Pont, who had inherited the lands of Shires Mill, north of Curos, in 1550. Now, Timothy's father, Robert Pont, was a learned clergyman. He was a friend to John Knox, an advisor to King James VI. And Robert was something of a career theologian. He was moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland on five separate occasions. Amongst various other offices, Robert was also a church commissioner for Moray, Inverness and Banff. And between 1571 and 1585, he was also the provost of Trinity College in Edinburgh. We know in 1574, the master of Trinity College granted Timothy Pont lands in Strathmartin, north of Dundee, and income from those lands was used to pay for Timothy's education and his subsequent surveying work. Now, we can be certain about Timothy matriculating at St. Leonard's College in St. Andrews for the academic year 1580-81. to 81. St. Leonard's can be seen just at the lower left of the uh, cathedral here. We can surmise that in the years when he was a St. Andrews undergraduate, he would have encountered William Wellwood, who was professor of St. Salvator's College, and he taught arithmetic, geometry, geography, astronomy, and significantly, the making of charts. He might also have come into contact with John Geddy, also based at St. Andrews, and crediting, credited with drawing the bird's eye view that we see here. In 1592, John Lindsay, who was master of the mines in Scotland, appointed Timothy Pont to undertake a survey of minerals and metals in Orkney and Shetland. Timothy was appointed to the Caithness Parish of Dunnet in 1601. Oops, I just uh, uh, slip a slide back. There's uh, the location of Dunnet on the Caithness map of Scotland from 1595. And it's possible that Timothy Pont's mapping work was complete by then, although it's conceivable too that he was in effect an absentee minister, using his time and the church's income to carry on mapping into the 17th century. Pont's only dated map is that of Clydesdale, and we can read here Sept et Octob 1596 descriptor. But his written description of Cunningham district in southwest Scotland dates from around 1604 to 1608. We know Timothy Pont tried unsuccessfully to secure new lands that were being settled by Scots in Ulster in 1609. In 1611 he was in Edinburgh but we don't know how long he had been there or for how long he stayed. By 1615 Timothy Pont was dead. His wife Isabel that year recorded as a widow. So what survives by Timothy Pont? Well there are 78 identifiable maps on 38 sheets of paper and these confirm that Pont mapped large parts of Scotland even if the coverage of these surviving maps was incomplete. We know not all of his manuscripts survive, but from the wider evidence, it's clear that Pont's work extended over pretty much the whole country. But Pont was far more than just a map maker. He also recorded extensive written notes, some of which are with the maps, and in this case here, in Timothy Pont's own handwriting. Other textual notes survive in a transcribed form by people, as we'll come on to see, who worked on Pont's maps and texts after he died. This image here we're looking at is from a manuscript by Robert Gordon of Strollock, dating from the 1630s or 1640s, where he writes uh, at the top, Ross and the parts thereof out of Mr. Tim Pont, his papers. 
and some of these written notes that we see here were published in more recent times. Pont's topographic description of Cunningham in the 19th century and Macfarlane's geographical collections in the early 20th century. We'll return to look at these notes a little later. So why is Pont's work important? And what information does his work include? Well, first, Pont's manuscript maps identify over 9,500 named places, mainly of human habitation, as we see here focusing on the area around Falkirk. And just to say this detail too is from the map that's currently on display in our treasures gallery. Now, once we add to Pont's manuscript maps, his handwritten maps, the engraved maps that we'll come up to look at a little later that were based on Pont's work, our number of place names, as I mentioned earlier, jumps up to 20,000. An incredible tally and very detailed gazetteer of 16th century Scotland. And for most of these places, this is the first time that they were ever recorded on a map. For many of them too, their modern equivalents are quite easy to confirm as we see here, for example, for Falkirk in the center, Calendar Castle, just to the, the lower right, and other places like, for example, Air and Air Castle uh, on the shore of the Firth of Forth, and a little further down, Grange marking the position of the present day Grangemouth. Note too that on this map, Pont also records the location of the Antonine Wall that we see as a, a string of dots running across ways from left to right. Uh, and, and this was very much part of Pont's broader remit, not just to map the present day landscape in the 16th century, but also to map antiquities as well. Now, as well as indicating the presence of these places and where they were, Pons also provides a useful clue on their pronunciation too. We're looking here at Northern Fife. Uh, this is the Firth of Tay at the top uh, between Nuba uh, and, and Lindores. And uh, Balmerino, as we can see over on the far right-hand side. And Pont records uh, in the centre top this name, Bambrich. Now, this name derives from the Gaelic uh, Beal Nabruach, or Estate of the Slope, coined in the era roughly between 900 and 1200 AD, when Gaelic was the predominant language in the area. And Pont helpfully confirms for us the pronunciation of Bambrich is very similar to the modern form today. Secondly, Pont's maps illustrate what has been called a landscape of power. Large castles, tower houses and boroughs are drawn as pictures, allowing us to visualize them clearly and see them within a political hierarchy of settlements and dwellings. This plan that we can see here of, of Elgin shows the, the castle at the, the right-hand end, St. Giles Church, a little further down, and the cathedral with its flattened gable end at the right-hand end. Some idea of the size of Elgin was also given, the fact that there were rudimentary walls with ports that confirmed the status of the borough and provided a boundary for it. We can also see, just while we're here, these crosses within circles that show the location of water mills on the river Lossy to the north. And Pont's depiction of larger castles and tower houses is very informative to, for architectural historians. As shown here, Duffus Castle and Spiny Palace were both impressively powerful fortified residences, standing on the edge of Loch, Loch Spiny, which was once a sea loch with a good safe anchorage. The loch, in fact, silted up over time and was drained in the early 19th century, so Pont's map gives a useful impression of its much larger extent in the 16th century. Duffus Castle was a mott and bailey castle dating from the 12th century, 
one of the strongest castles in Scotland and a fortified residence for more than 500 years. Spiny consists, as we can see here, of a massive keep within a large courtyard, the fortified residence of the bishops of Moray. And Punch shows us the central keep or St Davies, Davies Tower rises six storeys high with a garret at the top and the enclosing courtyard walls were flanked by square towers. Ponce often provides us with useful evidence of the earlier positions and layouts of settlements. As we can see here in the top image, the small borough of Hamilton was known to lie directly in front of the main castle structure until Duchess Anne in the late 17th, early 18th century decided to forcibly clear it away. On John Wood's map that we can see down here, Hamilton Palace flat stands in, in splendid isolation. But Pont provides us with the only good earlier map evidence that the former high street in fact ran directly in front of the palace, an early townscape that fell victim to urban clearance. In addition to the impressively useful sketch of Castle Minis by Aberfeldy shown here, Pons also gives us a useful sketch of the formal gardens that you can see here to the eastern side with parterres which can be identified today. We can see here too that Pons also distinguishes many other buildings. The Kirk of Wien that we can see down here with the, the building beneath a cross. The position of the River Tay in the foreground in fact is much closer to the castle then than it became in later centuries. Pong was also interested in drawing many natural features in the landscape, such as we see here for the distinctive and impressive Ben Lawyer's Ridge above Loch Tay, just a few miles west of Castle Minis. Now, when this area was next mapped in the 1760s, many of the smaller farms that are there along the, the northern side had been cleared. And so Pont provides us with very useful evidence of the earlier, more populous rural settlement. Just a note too, whilst we're here, that Pont also records fair salmons, trouts, eel and pearl uh, in Loch Tay. A eulogy on the natural features which, as we'll see later, were very much part of Pont's broader remit. Ponce maps collectively name and show over 350 mounties, many of these drawn as distinctive profiles, not the amorphous molehills that we're used to seeing on many early uh, contemporary maps. And we can see these distinctive profiles with other examples, for example, like Ben Loyal here in Sutherland. Now, this view of Ben Loyal from the east shows the hill fort and Castile on the northern summit, that's this structure uh, here. And in fact, by upon locating the position of this hill fort, it, we're able to accurately position his location when drawing the sketch, which was a settlement in the 16th century on the east side of Loch Loyal. In other areas, Ponce mountain profiles were perhaps useful as directional devices. This little sketch is looking south towards Mount Keen uh, and Glintana in the foreground and the ridge of mountains running east of Mount Keen. And this was an important moon pass between Deeside uh, and the Angus Glens to the south, which was in active use in Ponce time. Ponce maps are also our earliest graphic record of the extent of woodland cover in Scotland in the late 16th century. And in places, these confirm the trend which gathered pace at this time for the gentry to enclose and plant woodland around some of the larger castles or tower houses, shown here for Tullibarden and King Cardin in Glen Almond. And sometimes Pont even records the types of tree so that we see here on the south side of Loch Leven uh, in Inverness, he records many fir woods here alongs. And sometimes too, 
if we zip north to this woodland in Strathnava, Ponce written notes, uh, which we can see here for the, the Wood of Skell, where he writes, here, iron's made. Can also record other activities, such as iron smelting. And just a note in passing here too, Ponce secretary hand and italic hand. Both were common forms of writing style by this period. And Ponce seems to have used his secretary hand, such as we see for the, 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 the here irons made statement, for all notes, and his italic hand for all place names. Sometimes Ponce's notes bring home some of the many dangers that he must have faced on his travels. Geographic remoteness and hostile terrain is something we can easily relate to today with this description of this park of Sutherland, as extreme uh, wilderness up here. And uh, if we see uh, lower down this, uh, this statement down here, uh, perhaps if uh, rewilding takes off in Scotland, we'll soon be able to experience this too. But there were actually many other dangers of travel for Timothy Pont. Recurring plague was a significant killer in the late 16th century. Many parts of the borders, as well as parts of the highlands, were really beyond any state control and were particularly lawless. In Glen Lyon, Mad Colin Campbell, as he was known, ruled an anarchic kingdom, hanging, killing with impunity. And for Pont really to have drawn the landscapes that he drew in this area, it must have required the authority of Campbell's clan superior, Campbell of Bredalban. Blood feuds were a standard feature of lowland society in the later 16th century and could sometimes involve regional civil wars claiming hundreds of lives. One of these, in fact, included the second Earl of Moray, who was butchered to death by the Gordons at Donnybristle Castle in Fife in 1592. The breadth of information that Ponce includes is one of the continually surprising things about his maps. At the western end of Loch Tay, we've got the location of three island dwellings, or Cranogs, whose locations have been confirmed by more recent underwater archaeology. On some of the maps, we can also read the names of the owners of many of the larger properties. This is the Castle of Gowrie we're looking at, between Errol uh, and Dundee, where Pomp picks out the names of uh, Moncur of that ilk, as we can see here, Monorgan of that ilk. And in fact, within this rather messy text, there are a large number of other names of lairds and gentry. So what Pont gives us really, in summary, is, is a unique picture of Scotland at the end of the 16th century. Here is a largely rural country of firm tunes, great houses, and country mills. He does so in an inconsistent cartographic language that is in fact wholly consistent with his time period. Stylized front view drawings for prominent buildings, for towns and, ta and for cities, and different symbols for woodland and the smaller settlements. He shows much of the topography of Scotland and its river systems, both its physical and its human geography. And through Pont's work, Scotland became one of the best mapped countries in Europe. So, moving on with our story, how did he do it? Was this really the work of just one man or a team effort? The answer to this might seem to be yes, given the absence of evidence to the contrary, but with important qualifications. On a later letter, it was noted that Pont undertook all that work completely on his own. But it's likely that Pont had guides to secure his safe passage through parts of the country. We are told on, on one of the maps, and this is a, a little transcription of this text here, of Ewan Cameron, an informant, providing details on one map. Elsewhere, there are notes which mention other people as informants. So as we read here, 
uh, down below the statement, he says, he says, it's but seven miles. Uh, and so Ponsu probably did not speak Gallic and would have needed such linguistic as well as cartographic assistance, must have had more than one such guide for his labors. In terms of practicalities, how did he actually go about the mapping work? Did Pont use triangulation, illustrated by this much later map showing ordnance surveys, primary triangulation in Scotland? And triangulation allowed accurate distances to be computed just based on the angles between particular points in the landscape, provided one line of those triangles was a measured baseline. There's no evidence that Pont used triangulation, even though these methods were well known at this time and used in other detailed maps, especially of estates and military sites. There's no standard scale on Pont's map, little evidence to suggest that Pont used instruments in the field to fix the position of places. In terms of their planar metric or geodetic position, many features are inaccurately placed. There are nevertheless many clues that Pont leaves us to his methods. Many features are shown as sketches in outline or two-dimensional form almost as if he gained vantage points in the countryside in order to depict them. Several of his maps focus on river valleys as a basic unit, bounded by a watershed. It may even be that such catchment areas, we see here for West Water and Norren Water in Angus, provide the basic unit of Ponce mapping. Quite often, Pont's written notes also, also describe an itinerary along river valleys with distances between places and some major landmarks. For example, in the environs of the River Dolin and Straths Bay, uh, he writes, and the, the text is up here and uh, transcribed down below, the head of the River Dolin doth march with Killin in Strathake. This, in fact, flows north uh, into Loch Ness, six miles above Dalton Craigach. The River Dolnan is 14 miles long, and it ends in Spey, over against Abernethy at Invertulnan. It's got wood on six miles along it next to, next to the Strath Spey, and the six or seven seats or dwellings upon it above Dalton Craigach. I won't read all of the paragraph below, but just to pick out the names of Dalradi and Kinrara. Now, when we look at this map based on Pont's work, we see how these kinds of itinerary and distances can be pieced together into basic maps. We've got the river Dolnan flowing along here, meeting the Spey at Abernethy. Further along, you can just about pick out the name of, of Dalradi and a little further downstream Kinrara. And that's just one little text. Amassing the other text together with other surveys provided the fuller picture. Now, of course, when Pont's separate river valley maps were meshed together, it resulted in gaps or overlaps that needed attention. And we see this with other notes scattered liberally across Pont's maps. At the top left here, a note, this should be joined. These bits should be shunted further together. This three miles more near. A statement in French, uh, which can be translated as all of Edra Killis, should be contracted by a league. And to the lower right here, the statement, this ardidity, sorry, excuse me, this ardidity should be fornent logi olman. The ardidity here, in other words, should be moved further downstream, uh, opposite the other side of, uh, of logi olman. Pont's maps that survived were working drafts. Often these notes to himself would have been used to compile better and fuller drafts 
that shunted the landscape around and brought things into better position. We can surmise that Pont arguably followed the lines of rivers and river valleys, piecing together smaller mosaic pictures to make larger composite maps and almost certainly drawing by eye rather than measuring with a chain or with any real measurement. Now, how should we try to understand what Pont did? It's not in any sense a topographic survey born of detailed measurements. His coverage is incomplete, his symbolization inconsistent. He uses textual description to elaborate upon place name information. It's inappropriate to judge Pont's maps in terms of accuracy, if by that term we mean locational exactitude, scale representation. His remarks often concern the quality of places, the lineage of families, the content of the nation rather than its dimensions. And what Pont gives us is not so much a geographical or topographical survey underpinned by a concern for representational accuracy, but rather an essentially qualitative, even impressionistic account in text and image of the nature of the nation. Contemporaries knew this as chorography. Chorography was the most widely practiced form of geographical inquiry in this period. In England, France, Germany and Italy at this time, courtly geographers and mapmakers wrote and practiced chorography. Unlike cosmography, which dealt with the earth in relation to the heavenly bodies, and geography, which dealt with the description of the whole earth, chorography aimed at the delineation in maps and in text of local areas, specific parts of the globe. Chorography was essentially concerned with the quality and the character of places and areas, as we can see here for the Blau Atlas map and text for the Lothians. It was concerned with that description of the area rather than its accurate location or measurement. Chorography then was a widespread form of land writing, knowing which landed families were where, where mines and forests lay, where towns were located, roughly their size, what the produce of the region was, and so on. So knowing that what Pont undertook was a chorography helps greatly in understanding what Pont did and the information he assembled, but it only partly explains why. The use of chorography as a form of state political and geographical survey has its origins in Renaissance Italy. Was Pont's work an attempt to fill the gaps in these European geographical projects? There is really, unfortunately, no evidence to confirm this. We know his father moved in learned and courtly circles in Scotland, and at least one element of Timothy Pont's career, the time he spent as an inspector of mines and minerals, was consistent with the aims of state surveillance. So was Pont's work a need for mapping a statecraft greater at home? King James VI faced considerable unrest in the Highlands and the Islands in the 1580s and the 1590s. The king's concern for civic order in the Highlands reached a high point with the passing of the Statutes of Iona in 1609. English was to be the language of civilization. Boroughs were to be established to promote commerce. Mike Pont's work had been part of a yet bigger geographical need to understand this new political entity, Great Britain. With the ascension of King James the VI of Scotland and first of England in 1603, knowing the realm through maps assumed great importance for the new United Kingdom. And that's why Pont's contemporary, near contemporary, John Speed, produced his 1611 atlas, which was called the Theatre of the Empire of Great Britain, which included this map of Scotland within it. This was Britain's first atlas to help integrate the empire of the newly established Great Britain. And no less than kings, churchmen and civil authorities needed to know the areas of jurisdiction that they were responsible for. From 1588, 
Robert Ponce had been appointed to a commission whose brief was to visit northern Scotland with a view to planting ministers there, that is, filling the church vacancies or new positions with churchmen loyal to the new faith. Was Timothy Pont's task actually ecclesiastical, even specifically Presbyterian, to map the location of churches and nobles' houses, to plot the, the bounds of religious and political loyalty? It's hard to imagine Timothy wasn't exposed to something of his father's concerns in this area. Now, I'm not going to answer the why question, because I think we'll probably never know for sure what prompted his work. But we should not be in any doubt that Pont's manuscript maps and textual descriptions are a crucial record of Scotland's geography and history, and a vivid demonstration of the importance of mapping to national self-recognition. But Pont's work, magnificent and awesome as it was, failed in a crucial respect, getting the maps printed and published in Pont's time. The departure of King James for London in 1603, the death of his father Robert in 1606, undoubtedly reduced the high level political support for publishing his work. And Scotland's printing community at this time lacked the technology and capital for a major atlas publication. So it took others to bring Pont to print, and as they did so, they added to Pont's work in the process. Pont's heirs are recorded as neglecting their heritage, and by the 1620s, the maps were reported as being worm and moth-eaten, becoming illegible even to careful eyes. But fortunately, others understood their significance. In 1628, they were acquired by one of Scotland's leading government officers, Sir James Balfour of Denmilne, then Lord Lyon. And he quickly passed the maps on to a fellow, uh, a fellow man based in Fife, as we see here by his location, Sir John Scott of Scots Tarvid, who was a privy councillor, Lord of Chancery and Lord of Session. Intellectually and economically, Scotland was closely bound to the Low Countries in the 17th century, and Amsterdam was by this time becoming the world center of geographical publishing. The Blau firm, under the guidance of Willem uh, and his son, Johan Blau, its leading publishing house. And Sir John Scott had been in correspondence since the 1620s with the Blaus, who at this time were embarking on their World Atlas project. For Scott and for the Blaus, Ponce maps were a chance to place Scotland and themselves at the heart of European publishing projects. By 1631, Scott had passed all of Ponce maps to the Blau firm. By 1642, Blau had completed the engraving of about 35, 36 maps directly from Ponce's work. Perhaps during this time, the red grid that we can see on some of the Pont maps was added by Blau to assist with this copying process. But the maps forwarded by Scott were insufficient, problematic, lacking in coverage or illegible. And so Blau, in order to complete his atlas, pull together a list of the areas for which more complete maps were needed and returned to Scotland the maps of these areas, enlisting the help of Robert Gordon of Strelock to help complete the work. Now, our ability following digitization to quantify ink colors on digital images and select color simultaneously has been very helpful in confirming the extensive additions to Ponce maps made by Robert Gordon. Where Ponce and Gordon's writing is separate, as we can see here uh, on this map of Stirlingshire with Gordon's handwriting over, over here on the left hand side and Ponce's handwriting over here on the right, their different handwriting styles can be identified and distinguished. But where the darker lettering frequently overwrites the original browner, paler ink by Pont. They mimic the style of Pont's original hand. And this work in the 1990s confirmed not only that Robert Gordon added several categories of information to Pont's manuscript maps, including titles, 
scale bars, mountain shading, compass roses, as well as place names. But also that these areas were in a geographically specific part of Scotland that was the area that Blau had requested coverage for. Now it's fortunate for us today that Blau did reject some of Ponce maps and return them to Scotland because these rejects are the treasures that survive today. Passed to Robert Gordon's son James in the 1660s, he passed them on to Robert Sibbald in the 1680s and they were acquired by the Advocates Library, the precursor to the National Library of Scotland in the 1720s. All the better quality pomp maps that stayed with Blau would have been destroyed in the disastrous fire which engulfed the Blau printing works uh, in 1671. The engraving and printing of Ponce maps fundamentally transformed their original qualities. The variety, complexity, subtlety of Ponce's original first-hand record was generalised and standardised into a Dutch aesthetic as part of one of the greatest publishing projects the world had ever seen. The sumptuous artistry and engraving of these maps represent Scotland through the prism of the Dutch Golden Age. Ponce's name might live on uh, in the maps, but the stylized surveyor becomes a Dutch surveyor, and the lavish and ornate cartouches and ornaments reflect a very different world to Scotland in the late 16th century. Blau fully understood that the wealthy patrons who would buy such atlases were primarily interested in display, so aesthetic considerations such as luxury bindings, fine engravings, bright colour and beautiful typography were emphasised. By the 1660s, the Theatrum Orbis Terrarum, or Atlas Maior, as it had become known, had expanded to between 9 and 12 volumes, depending on the language. It had over 3,000 textual pages and approximately 600 maps. It was the most expensive book money could buy. So, we return to our friend uh, Mr. Timothy, and what can we say in summary? There are still many mysteries about Pont and questions we don't have complete answers to. Our understanding of Pont continues to change over time, where now Pont is understood as a chorographer, but he was once a surveyor, even Scotland's first topographer. We have no idea what he called himself. Historians have at one time or another attributed the maps and the handwriting on them to Timothy Pond, Robert Gordon, and sometimes others. Only recently has the advent of new technology allowed a clearer distinction to be made between them. But thanks to Timothy Pond, Scotland became one of the best mapped countries in the world. Pond could not have dreamed that his work would have been so important his publication so complicated, but his legacy so enduring. 400 years later, his work still rightly continues to attract wonder and amazement. Thank you very much. That's, that's wonderful, Chris. That's, thank you. Not a, not a satellite or a drone camera in sight, which uh, makes it amazing. So we've got time for questions. If anybody in the audience uh, has a question, then uh, just put your hand up and I'll get the mic to you. So bear with me. It would be interesting to know where Timothy Pont acquired these skills, which he so clearly demonstrated. Did you get that? No, I, I have to apologise. I'm slightly hard of hearing. So it's the a interest in the were... deafened after I've given an oratory like that. So I might need to ask someone to repeat the question. Where did Timothy Pont get his skills? Yeah, it's a very good question. And really, we've got a few fragments of detail from his, his life. And I think those fragments are clear that he studied at St. Andrews for three years at a time when people at St. Andrews were very expert in the arts of 
of map making in geometry and in mathematics. I mentioned William Wellwood, who was professor of canon law, who certainly would have, would have taught uh, Timothy. There's also a man called Robert Rollock, who was at St. Andrews at that time, who subsequently moved to Edinburgh, uh, who again taught geometry and mathematics. And so at one level, we know that there were people in St. Andrews, and St. Andrews was really the best place for Pont to have studied uh, in terms of mathematics and geometry. But at that time, within the broader, I would say, uh, Reformation culture of Scotland, learning and reading uh, and understanding choreographic and geographical and surveying works would have been part of a standard educational backdrop. It's a very lively time for map making across Europe. And in the 1570s, for example, Christopher Saxton was embarking on a major county-based survey of all of England and Wales within the, the Low Countries and in other parts of, of Europe. People were working in similar ways. And map making was not something that would have been alien uh, or foreign to him. But I'm afraid it may sound like a rather limited answer. We don't know enough detail about Timothy's life other than to make those kinds of inferences in terms of where he was at a certain point in, in time. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we're also live streaming. Martha, we've nothing on live streaming at the moment. I feel like bargain hunters. Does anybody else have a question? Sir, bear with me. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Hi. Just looking at my phone there. I'm from Kilmarnock, and I know Kilmarnock's not on the map. So I'm just looking at my phone. Um, Timothy Falkpoint visited Kilmarnock in 1605 and said there was a fair stone bridge over the river Marnock, yet there doesn't seem to be any maps. Do you think the, he maybe did do a map and it's just been lost in time or whatever? I know probably people can ask that for a lot of places in Scotland. I suppose I'm just asking about Kilmarnock. I noticed he had one in Fries and one at Paisley, so we're kind of in between and it's kind of missing. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I mean, really, the answers for that are partly uh, covered by the story of how the Pont maps collectively were transferred to the Low Countries and the maps that were engraved by Blau in fact cover really all of, uh, of Scotland and Blau had problems with a quite limited geographic area, primarily central Scotland and a few other outlying areas. Those ones he had problems with were returned to Scotland and those were other ones that survived. So when we look at what Pont covered. It's important to look at not just the manuscript maps, but the engraved maps. And the engraved maps by Blau, even though they don't cover uh, in the same kind of handwritten detail, but they do provide much broader coverage of the whole uh, country, even though they don't give the, sign, the same kind of information that the manuscript maps do. Thank you. Chris, can I just ask where can anybody look for the, the Pont maps just now? Yeah, that's a good question, and one I, I didn't cover, but if you want to see any of the Pomp Maps online, actually, if you just Google uh, Pomp Maps, it will take you to our Pomp Maps website, but if you go to the NLS, the National Library of Scotland Maps website, there's an option to search under Map Maker or Surveyor, and if you choose that option, there's an alphabetical list, and you go for P there, and that'll take you to the same page and actually our Pomp Maps website has a lot of other supporting information uh, as well as the maps themselves in terms of the history of the maps, subjects that are reflected on them and uh, there's a very long uh, bibliography of references there as well. Okay, some hands going up now so if you can bear with me. Are the blow maps there as well? Yeah, the Blau maps are all online. The way that we organise things is actually to put those under Blau rather than Ponce. And so if you're on that map maker's uh, page, go for Blau and you can go straight to the Blau Atlas of Scotland. And those maps are also available as Ponce maps are organised under our counties map section. So if you're interested in maps of Ayrshire or in maps of Perthshire, you can browse from our main homepage to counties, then choose those counties, and the Ponce and the Blau maps come up in chronological order. They're the earliest uh, ones in, in the list. But yeah, all, all very much there online. Great, thanks, Chris. And we've got a 
Martha, you've got one come to everybody just now. But yes. Martha, one from. I've got one from an online viewer asking, is it possible to geo-reference the maps to assess whether Timothy was taking latitude and longitude readings? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, the short answer is with huge difficulty. I won't say no, but it has been tried. And in fact, because Pont's methods were not to use trigonometry, not to use measurement, essentially his maps are a qualitative kind of view of what was where, um, as soon as you start trying to accurately pull the different places into their correct positions and locations with relation to each other, the map has to be mangled and warped. And for those that have tried it, uh, you need to mangle the map so much that you then can't read the, the place names. And what we tend to find with georeferencing, which is a very useful technique, especially for maps in the 19th and 20th centuries. By georeferencing, you can assign locations, pull the maps into position, overlay them on the real world, and compare them to one another. And we are very keen to georeference as many maps as it's useful to do. But generally, with Scottish maps, it's hard to go back really before the mid-18th century. The Roy Military Survey of the 18th century is one of the earliest maps that you can georeference, and even then it is problematic. Things wobble in and out of position. And with Pont, really, it's transforming him in a way that he would never have envisaged or intended as uh, being useful, even though I think for us, from a modern day perspective, we would find it much easier to recognize what we're looking at if we could compare it uh, side by side. Um, could, could you say something about the materials he used to make the maps, please? I got most of that. Could you say something about the... Materials. <laughs> materials. That, that he used. Yeah, I mean, they are primarily paper. Uh, so there's no vellum. At this time, there was a general growth of the use of paper in terms of being the medium for recording uh, charts. We have a few earlier charts that were on vellum, which is essentially a treated form of calf skin. And vellum was actually the main material for recording maps before the 16th century, particularly for things like porcelain charts or for Mappa Mundi. But for Ponce, really, paper was becoming relatively available. Uh, it, was, it was a high price, but it was affordable and by far the easiest medium for him to use. And it allowed him to physically stick different pieces of paper uh, together, as well as being quite a portable medium. So what we're looking at are Timothy Pons iron gall ink that he would have uh, used at this time uh, on, on paper. The only other kind of ink that we can see on the maps uh, in terms of colour is a red grid. And this is only on four of the maps that are known to have been used as the master uh, manuscript drawings for the Blau engraved maps, and that includes the map of Stirlingshire that I showed a brief image of and is on display in the Treasures Gallery. And the red grid, we think, was added by Blau as a way of copying the map because it only survives over parts of some maps that were ones directly uh, in the engraved and uh, printed equivalent. So yeah, it's essentially ink on paper is the answer. Um, fascinating talk, by the way. Um, yeah, there's two questions. If it hadn't been for the Protestant Revolution, I mean, it's just, he's doing this 20 years after, um, and he's commissioned by the Church of Scotland, would it have happened? And the second question is, in the 15th century, there was a huge amount of trade between Scotland and the low countries. For instance, in Musselburgh, um, there's a clock that was donated or gifted by uh, the Netherlands and it's dated 1496 and it's still there, you can see it in the, at the toll booth. Um, so was it as much trade that made, got the maps to be published in the Netherlands, low countries, or was it because of the, the Reformation? Yeah. 
They're both very good questions, those, and I can't give you quite as good answers. What I would say is that the Reformation was vital in really creating the climate that Pont worked in, not only for his father, uh, who was a key uh, instrument, really, of planting uh, ministers, uh, uh, reformed and extending, really, the Reformed Church around Scotland. That was very much part of his remit, and Robert Pont travelled widely uh, as part of that remit as well. He organised not only the ministerial uh, position for Timothy at Dunnett, uh, but also Timothy's older brother, Zachary, was actually appointed to a neighbouring parish at the same time. But people have looked in detail at Pont's maps and said, OK, if it was simply a survey for the church, if it was really just, if you like, for Robert Pont, uh, if it had been an ecclesiastical survey, why did he record so many other features that were not really of great interest to the church? When we look at the maps themselves, churches too are not really very significant items in the landscape. Much more significant are boroughs and tower houses. A lot of natural features in terms of mountains and woods. Uh, a lot of the antiquities were really of no interest to the church either. And this is why people have tended to look at all of these features combined and say, what kind of a survey was interested in all those features. And the best answer tends to be this choreographic survey, this idea of a volume that includes maps and texts. And those maps really illustrate all of these elements in the landscape. They're far more than being just something that the church would have been interested in. But the Reformation, the culture that it created, uh, and the wider interest in learning, uh, as well as in the relative pacification of Scotland were all vital for the kind of work that Pont did uh, to progress. Now, in terms of the links with the Low Countries, those were vital for getting the maps published, absolutely for sure. But it was really nothing to do with Pont or Scotland, that the Low Countries by the 1620s were becoming the main centre in Europe for map and atlas publishing in the 16th century, Italy had been that centre, and the earliest maps we have of Scotland often produced, drafted, and engraved in Rome. By the mid 17th century, everything shifted to the Low Countries. Amsterdam becomes this big centre of map production. And actually, Timothy's links with that Amsterdam world were quite tenuous. He had contacts with an engraver in 1610 based in Amsterdam. But apart from that, it was really left to his successors to get the, the work printed. There's no doubt, though, that those links between Scotland and the Low Countries were very useful for the interactions to happen. The, so John Scott of Scots Tarvet was in regular communication with the Blaus. The transport of other goods and commodities between Scotland and the Low Countries was all happening. And so those kinds of communication were definitely facilitated by those kinds of uh, uh, connections, really. Yeah, so that's about the best answer I can give on that. In the context of an earlier question regarding georeferencing, you mentioned that uh, Pont had no interest or inclination to, to integrate the maps. Why, why do you say that? So Pons, Pons tried to, to do what? To integrate? You said he had no inten interest or in intention of integrating the different maps together to make them consistent with each other. I'm sorry, I probably didn't explain that well enough because what I was trying to say is that Pont didn't try and produce a geographically accurate map. That's really what I, I wanted to imply by that. In other words, I think most of us today with our modern idea of map making feel it's essential that there should be an exact distance between places that represents that distance on the ground and there should be that bearing between places that is accurate and it's not really a map it's just a picture without that but in Pont's time there was not the same requirements for geographic accuracy the maps were not in any sense intended for travel or for people to find their way around. They were intended for people from other countries 
to visualize the nation of Scotland, to look at Ayrshire, to look at the Lothians, to read about those areas. And therefore, the general lie of the land, the approximate locations were good enough. It was good enough to see pictures of these places, their rough arrangement, rather than to know that they could literally put a ruler on the map and say, ah, oh, yeah, it's a mile and a half between that place and, uh, and, and the other place. But Pont certainly did try and pull his maps together. Uh, I didn't want to imply that. What we have with some of his sketch maps are some of the early drawings that show separate river valleys and then later drawings that show these pulled together. And do remember too that the, the manuscript maps that we can see are really the dregs of his output. They're the ones that were rejected for one reason or another by Blair. They're the ones that he would have liked to have kept in the desk drawer because all his best stuff went to Amsterdam, stayed in Amsterdam and literally uh, went, went up in smoke. Humans form a rejects like this. They really are magnificent work of art. And ladies and gentlemen, I need to bring this afternoon's event to close. I hope you've enjoyed it half as much as I have. Thank you for all coming along. Thanks for everybody that's been live streaming today. And it just ends by please join me in thanking Chris Lee. Thank you. Thank you.